I think artists, they have a certain way of thinking about the world that helps people see a new reality. Explain the world to us in a more nuanced way. Being part of the future of these communities and the vitality of the communities. Think of culture as a, a, an ability to bring about a great diversity. Each of us, we are made of different layers of cultures. The French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty once said, just as places are sensed, senses are placed. He seems to describe perfectly the reciprocal relationship between the setting and the substance that exists at the core of the way we choose to capture the physical and social dimensions of every vibrant community. As people across the world are required to remain in isolation, and as we begin to lose touch with the public spaces of everyday life, what are the places we miss and what policies, funds and infrastructure are required to sustain those locales? This conversation about the role of culture in vibrant communities brings together a distinctive group of architects, historians, librarians, museum directors, philanthropists and urban planners to explore the ways in which we design and determine the cities and communities in which we enact and transact our daily lives. Libraries have always been an open space of uh, equal access and uh, where librarians are the custodians of knowledge past and the incubators of knowledge future. And in fact, uh, it's one of the places where you can find uh, a point of view and it's, uh, and, uh, a, it's counter point of view uh, and read about both. And uh, that function is going to become more important, not less important, uh, in the period in which we are living with the enormous explosion of information that we are witnessing. Because sometimes uh, I've given as, a, as a, an example, I said, you know, uh, we needed to, to, to drink. And when we were in developing countries when I was young, we didn't have access to the books and access to many things. So it was like somebody who's parched for water and you put a few drops on their tongue. That's not enough really to drink. But then if you open a fire hose on me, I also cannot drink. <laughs> I can't drink out of a fire hose. So the librarians, therefore, are going to have to curate information, to organize information. And specifically, in the period where we are witnessing an enormous growth in, uh, in social media, which has enormous amounts of uh, uh, conspiracy theories and all sorts of wrong information, it would be important to be able to go to library websites and find the, the uh, trusted information, or at least portals that will lead you to academies, to research institutions, etc., that will give you the right kind of information. But what about the building itself? Do we still need bricks and mortar libraries? The answer is yes. I think we do. But it will have to be different kinds of libraries than those that we had before. Uh, by that, I mean we need a space where uh, kids can really be creative and have some rock music and uh, some pizza cartons on the floor and movie posters on the wall and talk to each other and uh, do their thing. Secondly, you need another kind of space where more and more young people, especially those who are studying in uh, universities and so on, do some group work. And then we have our conventional client that we got used to in the libraries, uh, in the reading rooms of libraries where people, the librarian would go shh to everybody and so on. And that is somebody who's doing deep research and wants a cubicle and access to information and work there. But we also need a space where the library can be the interaction between the library, specialized space, whether it's in a university or not, and the community and where we can have special exhibitions that are backed up by the knowledge uh, of the library and the librarians. And these four types of spaces can be done. So when people say, but where are we going to get the space to do that? 
The answer is simple because we're going to remove many of the stacks that are presently taking up a lot of space. We'll put them into off uh, uh, site storage. We'll have digital copies of everything. And if somebody wants specifically to see the, the uh, published version, well, you can send for it on the off site storage and get it back within a day. Is that a problem? Not at all. It is wonderful because for the first time we have a librarian's dream that I can make access to knowledge available to a remote village uh, and to have also uh, much greater access. So for example, in the Library of Alexandria, I had 1100 uh, periodicals published. And these require, of course, that you enter them into the catalog, that you bind them year by year, uh, and uh, uh, put them in storage and so on. On the other hand, I had 73,000 periodicals that are digital. And that would be accessible by computer. And we had 3,000 computers in the building so that visitors could access almost anything they wanted right away. So uh, we are in a transitional period. And I think that period is very exciting uh, because the new technologies are making available enormous amounts of information and our ability also to extract more information from that, like, for example, overlaying maps, historical maps of different periods uh, of the same uh, item that we can do now, we couldn't do before, etc., etc. So libraries are a very special place. They are a place uh, which is truly a space of freedom. So uh, from my own experience, when I started the Library of Alexandria, uh, I had Western in, in, uh, newspaper people and uh, reporters asking me, uh, how can you uh, have a library like the Library of Alexandria uh, when uh, there is uh, censorship? I said, I have no censorship here. And they said, well, at that time, there's a book called The Satanic Verses of Salman Rushdie which, uh, as you probably know, uh, caused an enormous uproar at a particular point in time. And uh, they said, could you have such a book here? And my answer was simple. Not only can I, I do. Look it up. It's in the catalog. And you can actually uh, uh, order it from the desk of the librarian. And you can get it here. And uh, so they were satisfied. But then immediately, I got a huge series of attacks from Islamists uh, in Egypt at the time and uh, on television. And I went on television and I defended it. And I said, uh, uh, there's a difference between uh, uh, publishing and circulating a book and having it in the library. So uh, you disagree with this book? I said, of course I disagree with this book. It's an offensive book and so on and so on. I said, fine. Would you like to write a rebuttal? to Mr. Rushdi, and he said, of course I would. I said, fine. And where would you find a copy of Mr. Rushdi's book in order to write your rebuttal? You come to me. You come to the library. And when you publish your rebuttal, I will also put it on my shelves. <laughs> I will have it on my shelf. The Library of Congress is the National Library for the United States. It is the research arm of the United States Congress, and that is comparable to what a parliamentary uh, library would be in other countries. It also is the largest library in the United States, and it serves everyone. A book that I have to mention that discusses the social infrastructure role and place of libraries globally is called Palaces for the People. And I'm going to look directly at the subtitle because it's important. How social infrastructure can help fight inequality, polarization, and the decline of civic life. And it's by Eric Kleinenberg. And it speaks to the role that most public libraries have in communities and the outlook for making sure that people who are looking at their countries and communities and societies consider the fact that there are sometimes more public libraries in 
communities than any other public institution other than schools, and that they are entities that can contribute to civic life. In 2015, after the death of uh, Freddie Gray and the intense community unrest and uncertainty, the public libraries, and there was one particular one that was at the epicenter of the unrest and where the incident actually happened. The librarian was at, at that facility was very concerned. Not so much that the library would be damaged as much as it would not be available to the public when they needed it. And so we decided, and I was there the next day after the people throughout the world saw a car burning that was right across from that facility. Uh, when we opened up that library and there were people from the community who were so grateful. And then by the end of the week, the library was the only public facility open. There were no commercial establishments open and the library became a food distribution center, a place for young people and educators were giving classes. It was a place that social services were being delivered and the media had no other place to go. And so the library became and maintained its position as a hub in a city that was going through so much. One part of looking to the future after communities and cities like Washington, D.C. and Baltimore have had to physically shut down, be in a different environment totally, and, and everyone is uh, challenged. Libraries have really, I think, taken on the mantle very strongly of being part of the future of these communities and the vitality of the communities, the virtual programming that is going on, the convening power of libraries and being that space digitally as well as physically for people to come together and to discuss difficult issues to be able to provide the resources for that. And I hope that policymakers and people who are involved in thinking about the future of communities will consider the network of libraries throughout this world. I think one of the lessons we've learned during the COVID crisis when it comes to cultural institutions closing and then reopening is that these days you never really close. The, the digital component uh, of what you work upon is such a substantial part of the organisation now that even though the front doors on Cromwell Road and Exhibition Road might be locked, we're seeing people around the world understand our collections, engage with our learning, reinterpret their understanding of, of history and identity. Being the director of, of the VNA, you might think it's about objects, but really it's about people. Um, and it's the wonderful knowledge, uh, not only of the curatorial staff, but the interpretation staff, the marketing, the development, who make the uh, museum sing and work. But when I think more broadly about the, the human impact of COVID, I conclude that what museums and galleries and cultural institutions do is more important than ever because the growing isolation that comes with digital society combined with the physical isolation which the pandemic uh, has uh, put upon us may, means that museums as places of congregation, as places of social interaction, as places of haphazard engagement with people and objects and ideas become more important uh, than ever. So I think what we do in bringing people together and thinking about different cultures, identities and traditions has become more valuable. It's the responsibility of a museum to ensure that every community 
within the, 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 that, that the museum serves feels welcome, feels a sense of ownership, feels that when they step over the threshold, they are looking at items that belong to them as taxpayers, as community members, um, as members of the, the public who go into that space. And if there is a sense that this isn't for you, this isn't for the likes of you, well, that is disastrous to our mission as, as public institutions and as public servants. And we have to work very hard um, very regularly to ensure that sense of the, the right to be in a place and, and, and to feel comfortable uh, in a place um, is held at all points. I think we should be concerned in, in the short term about the impact of COVID um, on dynamic urban areas. If the projections are right about more people working from home, about the thinning out of offices, um, you know, the, the trickle through impact to cafes, to sandwich bars, to uh, the, the kind of support economy uh, for that is, is worrying. But in, in the long run, what makes cities work is the, the dynamism of the people within them and, and often the quality of education uh, that they are providing. And so we in the museum sector, whether it's in Edinburgh or Glasgow or London or Bristol, um, we've got to do the heavy lifting now. It's our responsibility to say that you can only come to, you know, a, a, a fabulous collection like the V&A or the British Museum or the National Gallery in London. You can only see such riches uh, that Edinburgh has or Glasgow has or Newcastle has in those uh, cities and make the case for the the the, the enjoyment of urban life through the incredible experiences and collections um, and, and differences that you have in a concentrated urban area. And hopefully as, the, as concern about the pandemic eases and that very kind of animal spirit desire for new experiences, for new businesses, for new cultural opportunities begins to regrow that we have to support from a seed level um, as big cultural organisations, then the dynamic of the city uh, begins uh, again. Architecture and uh, city planning are very much a foundation element of the Aga Trust for Culture and it's uh, His Highness's um, wish that th this, this platform or this uh, sector uh, be uh, energized or activated, we could say, to help to create a better awareness of our um, built environment, our physical built environment, as well as the heritage within it in these parts of the world, and, and then ultimately and very essentially to improve the quality of life of the communities candidate projects or locations, um, in our case, um, in, within historic cities that are of, of great interest to us. And we, we see an opportunity to restore or conserve important built heritage, uh, while at the same time assisting a community which is living adjacent to this heritage. So in other words, we, we're not, uh, we would not typically get involved with a project which is a remote archaeological site or um, a, a cluster of buildings which is um, in, a, in a remote isolated zone which uh, doesn't have a community near it because we, we always uh, try to combine community redevelopment and support with uh, heritage and conservation planning. So they, they, the two have to work very well together in the symbiosis. The Dabal Ahmar um, Cairo Area Development Project which, um, which started with the uh, proposed gift by His Highness of building a public park in the uh, center of Cairo, basically in, in, uh, adjacent to the former um, um, Fatimid city and, uh, and the um, World Heritage Site of, um, of, of uh, Cairo, uh, Islamic Cairo. The park was um, not only created to, uh, to provide a wonderful green space and landscaping, and facilities for the uh, general population of Cairo. And by the way, it, it attracts 12% of the metropolitan area's population. Very much um, um, local residents, so it's not a touristic park for 
uh, foreigners. Um, primarily, it's, it's for the local residents of Cairo. Um, but in, uh, in addition to those um, objectives, uh, the park was meant to be a catalyst. And, um, and that is often the case with our area development projects. We have, a, we have an anchor project, which is supposed to revitalize and energize an area and, and to even to um, illustrate to the private sector that, look, there are opportunities around here if you, if you just put the dots together. In the uh, community side, um, Dabal Atmar, um, we had always intended the park to continue to provide uh, benefits and 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 in fact the Alizar Park um, management team and entity um, was planned so that it would generate surpluses, operating surpluses, and under an agreement we had with the Cairo governorate, um, it was agreed that these surpluses would, uh, which are obviously retained on site because this is a um, non-profit project, would be plowed back into the community, Dabal Ahmar community. Um, primarily. And so um, on a given year, um, um, since it was completed, uh, something t to the tune of uh, 150 to 200,000 US dollars has been recycled back into the community. And, and in order to make that happen, we created a Dabal Ahmar development um, uh, company. And um, it's been uh, working um, since, since the park was completed and is still there today. And they still continue to run a carpentry workshop. They are uh, supervising um, vocational training programs. They, uh, they, are, they commission and they support um, uh, individuals who make handicraft products, which are, um, they help to um, sell, export to other places, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, um, housing, housing is a very special um, uh, category of, of urban redevelopment because it can be costly and, and because you often need to have uh, participation by residents. And even there, we were able to find a way to blend some outside funding with um, um, owner, owner uh, finance and sweat equity, as it's sometimes called, to bring about these changes. Cultural her heritage um, has become a, an engine for redevelopment. And this is, um, and this is not um, surprising, but I think the question is, or the point is that you, you, if you structure it properly, if you set up the right um, project framework, you can, you can really achieve more and, and, and much more than if you just treat it as a purely architectural conservation project. You know, and those are, those, that sort of work used to happen in the 60s and 70s, you know, et cetera, 80s, excellent work. You know, they, um, they've saved many important uh, monuments around the world. But um, what we're talking about here is cultural heritage as a engine, a motor for redevelopment. And, and for that, you've got to be more inclusive in terms of what you look at, and you've got to, be, uh, you've got to take into account uh, the community living around it. And of course, you've got to do baseline surveys. You've got to know what the community's needs are, the gaps they have, uh, so you can work uh, with them and try to improve the quality of life. What is important with the Ark and the World for Architecture is that we're trying to not just go to the project itself, but what lessons can be learned, because lessons from good achievements, the achievements which are important, can be used in different contexts, in different countries. So interconnection between different people in neighborhoods, in cities, are very important. And that's why that you have to have a sense of belonging of those people. That is where you have to work on. There was a project which won an award in Copenhagen, which was public spaces created for them, which there in this area in the past two decades, people from some 60 countries and ethnic groups have been living in that area. And the only way to make these people interact was to have spaces that they would feel that they are a part of it. What happened is that they started a dialogue with all these 50, 60 different ethnic groups which were living there. The artists worked with them, bringing works of art, pieces of art from each of, each of these countries to this. And the architects and the landscape architects successfully used these elements in this urban fabric. And now, interesting enough, when you go to Copenhagen, one of the seven, eight places that it's in all tourist guides marked that has to be seen 
a super killing, an area which people did not dare to go there 15, 20 years ago. It is very difficult to predict the future of the city because uh, when, we, when you study the f and look at all our cities, they have been changing in different ways. Um, it depends on the population growth. It depends on uh, the uh, economic situation of each city. So one cannot c compare, you know, Dubai to London because they're, or to Rome because they're very different in their evolution in the past so many years. But what's important is that in a number of cities around the world, the expansion is so rapid that it doesn't leave time for the citizens and the, for the politicians and the, um, everyone to think about what they're doing. I think instead of sustainability, we have to use the word responsibility. How responsible we are in choosing our, the, our design, our materials, how we're going to have the impact. That is more important than just the, the word sustainability. Culture is evolving every day. There's no, nothing as a fixed culture in, is the same thing as not a fixed city. It's urban places, country, cities, they change, and the culture of the cities do change as well. It's not the same because the people who are the users, they are changing every day. So how we can adapt all these and use the culture as, as I said, as a motive, as a catalyst of bringing together the people and the society to have a better kind of a quality in that city of life. I grew up in uh, Mumbai in India. Uh, it was a city that I think when I look back retrospectively, really formed my perspectives on architecture and the city. And I got really interested even as a child in the idea of change and what change meant because I would go back to the places I grew up in for a few years and notice how the built environment had transformed. You know, what, what makes uh, cities in Asia, South Asia and in, in India particularly say different from cities in the West? And, I would argue that uh, cities in the West are much more, uh, as physical plants, stable entities. Architecture is almost the single most important instrument by which these cities are organized. In contrast, uh, the Indian city, and I think by extension the South Asian city, uh, architecture is definitely not the central spectacle of the city or the instrument by which the city is made and organized. It's people, the way they occupy space. Uh, they are counter spectacles. Festivals, for example, become the spectacle of the city and these happen periodically. In the city of Mumbai, I think the most important one is the Ganesh Chaturthi, which is the immersion after 10 days of worship of the god Ganesh, which is the elephant god and processions that entail millions of people uh, chant and they sort of weave them way, their way through uh, the city to immerse the clay idol of the god uh, at the end of this sort of 10 days of worship. Uh, and with that, uh, as that clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay where it's immersed, any memory of that spectacle kind of disappears. So these spectacles are not encoded in architecture. They don't even leave a trace. They disappear, they're ephemeral. I call this the kinetic city. It's, it's not the static city, it's the kinetic city. It's a city that is characterized by continuous motion, uh, by change, by landscapes reorganizing themselves. You know, how do you then kind of discern what might be the culture of a place and what is the role that even culture might play? Because culture is made and remade every day because they're implicit rules. And, uh, and these change, the culture of a place changes and transforms with every generation. It's like identity. These are not found definitions, but these are constructed definitions. And so by extension, when we look at cities, it's, I think, critical to ask the question uh, uh, about infrastructure uh, because the two are kind of linked. And I think uh, for me, uh, the, something that's really interesting and not been paid enough attention is the notion of cultural infrastructure. Because if you just took the notion of infrastructure, which is really the instrument by which we relate to each other in any society, and it's the instrument by which 
Actually, cities are made. Uh, they're made not only in the way they operate as physical entities, but they're also made in the way that through the instrument of infrastructure, people relate to each other. Now, infrastructure, if you nuance it in its understanding, you can break it into physical infrastructure, which would be the road, the pipes that take water uh, through the system or, th or through any urban system, etc. the power grid. But you also have social infrastructure, which is schools and clinics and hospitals and universities and uh, perhaps markets are where there's a kind of blur between the physical and the social. But you know, there's also an important category, which is cultural infrastructure, uh, which is infrastructure that allows you to make these kinds of implicit rules uh, that exist in societies. And one could argue that this could also be institutionalized because for culture to work and the kind of underpinning kind of foundation for culture is the trust that we begin to develop between us as human beings in any societies. And it's through that trust that we actually construct these implicit rules and how they shift, how they modify, how they morph uh, is actually a consensus that we build as human beings in any society. If you think of philanthropy, uh, in the case of a charitable foundation, that's, that's the business. If you think of that as marginal to society, as opposed to integrated into the fabric of society, you're going to fail. Uh, and Heron's uh, remit was helping people and communities help themselves out of poverty. Well, you can't do that on the margin. You have to start looking into to the systems in society that actually uh, create poverty or alleviate poverty and the ways in which a foundation can become an investor not only on the margin, but in the essence of what a, an economy can do. It's not okay for a business or for a government to say, well, we'll just operate the way we need to operate to make as much money as we possibly can, and then we'll kind of clean up the mess afterward by making some small grants. We have to be treating tomorrow's problem today, or we're, we're just not gonna make it. Organizations, as far as culture is concerned, I think um, people, people need gathering places. They have since the beginning of time. Uh, and gathering places will happen in, com in communities no matter where and how they are. Um, I think that if government is smart about culture, in, it will be creating, uh, it will be thinking about capital investment in a, in a holistic way, both the, the, the structure that supports people and allows artists to be artists or workers to be workers uh, and not, you know, not desperate all the time, um, but also in the way that they, uh, that they are part of making spaces uh, attract the revenue over time that they need to continue. I think artists are, for one thing, they, they have no choice but to be artists in most cases. Uh, they have a certain way of thinking about the world that helps people see a new reality. Uh, it might be a very, a very specialized reality or it might be a, a, a new vision for a whole community. Um, and then most interestingly, I think artists have a direct line to doing it's not just talking about, it's making it. And it's then going back and saying, what did we learn? What did we do wrong? And back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and you have only to be in a rehearsal process for any of the arts to understand that that discipline is fundamental. It is a sense of what are we, what is all this all about anyway? I, I don't know if this is an apocryphal tale, but I, I heard somewhere that during the Blitz, uh, Winston Churchill's um, finance minister wanted to close the ballet and the opera and the symphony and because for a variety of reasons that probably seemed pretty reasonable. Um, and Churchill replied, 
well, no, we aren't going to do that. What do you think we're fighting for anyway? Uh, and I think if you apply that to our society today, we have to say to ourselves, what is it that makes life wonderful and worth living and interesting? And how do we look to the future? And, uh, and artists are actually the ones who are doing the long-term basic research for the future.